Mr. John Flint, the chief executive, thank you so much for joining us. We have to start with trade. Sure. So how's the latest trade standoff between the US and China actually affecting your business? Uh, well, in the context of, of ours and our numbers, and we've been updating the market kind of every quarter on this, um, what we've been saying now really since the summer of last year is it's not yet visible in our numbers. And I think that's, that's still the case. But of course, the, the, the trade dispute has really only impacted the margins of business. So you can see in our customer base certainly anxiety about um, the potential disruption and dislocation to supply chains, the potential debates around whether or not supply chains need to get reorganized, whether there'll be a bifurcation, supply chains organized around the West versus supply chains being organized to serve, to serve the East. You can pick out anecdotal examples of you know, the, the flow of soybeans. Um, China consumes an enormous amount of soybeans, and they've been buying an awful lot more from Brazil of late than they have out of the US. But I think the dimension that, that often gets overlooked is the impact that the trade tension or friction is having on investment. So in our numbers, not a lot to see. Trade, anxiety, but you can definitely see a postponement in investment decisions whilst, because there's uncertainty created by this by this dispute. And the longer we don't know, the longer this tension continues without a resolution, without certainty, I think the, the, the greater the potential that this postponement of investment will just accelerate a slowdown. But is that worldwide, the postponement in investment, or is it particularly in the US and China? I think it's a worldwide thing. I mean, we've already got Europe um, experiencing reasonably soft, um, soft economic conditions. There's a different reason for postponing investment in the UK. I think, but, but, but generally, the, the, um, the US-China trade tension is the dominant economic theme. And I think it's affecting sentiment everywhere. Is this about trade, or is this something bigger? Is it about who will rule the world in the next 20 years? Oh, I, I think we've learned that it's definitely about something bigger. I, mean, I think trade is the first chapter in this, in this particular story. But when we get past trade, um, I think it's clear that there's a, a broader desire to see China contained in some way. Um, I think we'll move into a chapter that covers technology um, and maybe a bifurcation of technology and, and, and technology standards. You know, it's, Mike, in his, in his opening remarks, kind of um, referenced um, how much good has been done from a human perspective over, over the last sort of 50, 60 years. And, China's economic story, taking either 500 million people or 800 million people, whatever the, whichever number you choose to, to prefer, whatever that number is, that's an, an amazing story. And it's, and it's remarkable it, for many reasons, but it, it gives Western liberal democracies pause for thought, because here's a deeply socialist system that served its people really well. And it's been, it's been a very convenient narrative, I think, certainly in the West, for, for too long, to be able to point to socialist systems that fail their people. And here's one that, that's, that's delivered an extraordinary economic transformation. So I think it, is beyond, it does go beyond trade. Um, it is a, you know, it's, it's a new geopolitical front that we're all going to have to navigate. We're kind of hanging on this meeting between President Trump and President <laughs> Xi at the G20 in a couple of days. Yeah. What can they achieve? I really don't know. Um, and, and, and I think um, the personalities involved are such that it's very difficult to predict. I don't know what, I don't know what either of them are going in with. Um, and I think when we, when we try and construct that view, I think it's probably helpful to, to try and construct it working back from next year's presidential elections. Because I think uh, President Trump needs to engineer a strong economy to, to really um, bolster his chances of being re-elected. And I think he will be sitting down with his strategist and trying to figure out how, how best to do that. And I'm sure <clears throat> this data point, there is a, well, I'm sure, I would imagine there's a, there's a desired outcome from this data point, but I've got no idea what it, what it would be. Um, we were speculating in the, in, the, in the breakfast upstairs, you know, maybe, maybe another impasse that would be celebrated by the markets because the markets will then just extrapolate that the Fed will immediately rescue the markets by cutting. I really hope that's not what happens. Um, it seems to be a bizarre way to organize things. But, um, I don't. I, I really don't know. I'm, I'm just. I'm waiting for the tweets. I mean, are, are the um, are emerging markets actually too dependent on fen Fed policy? They certainly are dependent. You know, it's it's interesting. So nine months ago, the 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 buzz at the time was, are we about to enter a new emerging markets debt crisis? 
you know, Argentina was looking vulnerable, Turkey wasn't in great shape. Um, there were questions about some other countries, and that was all really driven by the fact that the Fed was very much still in tightening, tightening mode. I think it's, it's helpful um, for uh, emerging markets, particularly those with, with foreign currency denominated debt, that the Fed has paused and now looks like it might be entering an, an easing cycle. So it's definitely helped. But of course, um, it's, however, it's, there's two sides to that story. Um, debt servicing is going to be easier, but lower demand from the West, which is consistent with the fact that the central banks feel that they might be easing next, means that that's going to be a bit harder for the emerging markets. John, you're a great scholar of China. What do investors misunderstand about the Chinese economy or, or Chinese politics? Yeah, so in my role, I have the privilege of spending a lot of time in London and a lot of time in, in Hong Kong and China, and we have a, a great history there and really privileged access to, to leaders. And I think it's, um, there's definitely a bias in the West. There's definitely a, a bias that I think comes from a lack of understanding, a lack of, um, a lack of knowledge, um, a lack of experience navigating that system. It's a, it's a very different system, um, um, but it's one that works commercially. We built, we managed to build a great business there as a foreign, as a foreign, as a foreign bank. Um, so I think there's a uh, the success in China is really about being patient, about taking time to understand a different culture, a different, a fundamentally different governance system. But a, as I said, one that is serving its people well for now. Um, should we worry about respectful. debt? Chinese debt? Yes. I mean, I think there's always a concern. There's a, there should always be a concern. I think the, there will be pockets of debt in the system which are not great. Um, there will definitely have been some resource misallocation given the big credit expansion. Now, worth remembering, the big credit expansion that, that China embarked upon post-global financial crisis was one of the reasons that the Western economies recovered quite so well. You know, China through the, the coordination of the G20, played a huge part in helping stabilize the global economy at that time. Um, we bank, you know, we're, we've been very careful about the, segment, the segments and sectors that we bank in China. Um, debt, debt performance is good for now. But I think the, the thing to remember with China is that um, or debt crises generally only become a problem if um, there isn't a lender of last resort or there isn't there aren't the resources to make the debt good. China's still got plenty of resources. So if there are pockets of weakness in their domestic system, they've certainly got the resources to deal with it. And they've got lots of fiscal room too. Um, and they, you know, they employed a big fiscal expansion earlier this year, two trillion RMB, most of which has, has been directed towards um, the, private, the private sector, so the more productive sectors of the economy. So d debt will always be a concern. I think something we need to monitor, but. China's got the capacity to self-heal. Well, where will big banks grow in the next decade? Oh, well, for, for us, I think the, the macro themes are still point to um, the earnings potential out of Asia. Um, I think Asia will outstrip all other parts of the world. The Middle East, curiously, is a, is a, a resilient, um, certainly in our experience, a resilient region. Um, um, there's there's a, a reason every year to be worried about the politics of the region, and I think that's the, 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 the case again now. But the Middle East, I think, continues to produce good growth opportunities. Europe looks to be stuck in low growth and, and, and has structural issues to get through. The UK is, um, it could go either way. Um, it could go either way in quite, a, quite a, an extreme way. Um, and the Americas, we are hostage now to the presidential election cycle in the US. So I, 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 in the US economy right now actually is in very good shape. Um, slightly weaker data in the last few weeks, but the labor market is still tight. The economy is resilient um, and the labor market very flexible in the U.S. So optimistic generally about the U.S. market. But Asia is where the growth is going to come from. Um, John, about a third of all managed assets in the world, $31 trillion of capital now has some sort of green sustainable or ESG label attached to it. So how is that reshaping and influencing HSBC and other banks? It's a big issue for us. I mean, we're one of a few global banks left. So we work on the basis that we have a global stewardship responsibility for this transition to the low carbon economy. So um, we've tr we, are try we have tried and we continue to try and demonstrate a leader leadership position in this area. We're the number one um, arranger of GSS bonds. We have a $100 billion um, sustainable finance commitment. So we've provided just under $30 billion of that commitment so far. Um, we've got an energy policy, which I think is progressive, et cetera. So it's, it's something that we are 
we are leaning into in a very significant way. It's complex. Okay, what I can tell you as in my first year and a half of being chief exec is if you're trying to solve a global problem across lots of local and national constituents, it's very difficult to do that and not offend people. Um, and we've learned a lot in the last 18 months, but we haven't learned enough to, to persuade us not to pursue this. Um, I think that the one thought I'd leave people in the room with, though, is there's a, I don't think we should for a moment believe that this issue, ESG, or the transition to low carbon economy in business is yet mainstream. And people will tell you that it is, and all the asset managers, including ours, have teams devoted to these issues. But I can tell you that in all of, all of the investor meetings I've done since I've been the CEO of HSBC, which is probably 70, 80 meetings, um, it hasn't been raised once by the portfolio managers, by the investors, by the people making the decisions as to whether to be long or short or overweight or whatever. Um, so I think it, it's still the case that you know, growing, growing realization is important, growing realization we've got a big problem to solve. It's not quite yet at the heart of real decision making and, and it needs to be. But how do you define it? I guess this is one of the, the major concerns, right? Is that it, it, everyone seems to have a different definition <laughs> of green or, or sustainable. Yep. What guidelines do you think are helpful for any investor that wants to make a sustainable investment? Yeah, and this, this brings us directly into the whole disclosure area. I mean, I think the, the, green, the green debt markets, generally green bonds, green loans, I think there have been standards established there that are working. Those markets are growing nicely maybe 1% of all debt capital markets now get captured under, under the green banner, and we can see that growing to maybe 5 or 10% of the total. I think the, the key for us, though, in, in the way that we all think about this is now not to try and solve it by growing that um, on its own. We need all of the debt capital markets to begin to converge with the green credentials. We need the market um, to begin to adopt some of, those, some of those principles. TCFD, great initiative. Um, again, designed to increase the, the amount of disclosure, designed specifically to make things more transparent. But to my earlier point, we published updated TCFD disclosures um, earlier this year, um, quite blunt disclosures, not, not very detailed, but designed you know, as, as per the, the design of TCFD to, to reveal the next layer for us. That was the, the percentage of our loan book that's exposed to carbon intensive sectors. And we've had no engagement on it. So we, we put the numbers out there and we wait for, we wait for you know, the echo to come back, the questions to come back. And it's, it's, not, yet, it's not yet really kind of um, um, caught the imagination or caught mainstream activity in the, in the way that it should. I think there's a great debate as to whether TCFD on a voluntary basis is the way forward or whether it's going to need to become mandatory. I think increasingly it looks like it's going to have to become, uh, to become mandatory. But in, in, in the... In, in the absence of there being completely agreed standards, that, that shouldn't l slow anybody down. We should all just... But do you think there will be a, a generational shift, that millennial investors will look at this a little bit more? Without doubt. I think we're already seeing it. Um, and it's been interesting, actually. We, we establish what we think is a leadership position, uh, and then you get to feel good about that for about three months. And then something happens that shifts shifts the psychology. You know, and those of you who are London-based, you know, the Easter weekend, we had Extinction Rebellion here, got a lot of press coverage. And then we had David Attenborough talk about it. You know, interesting that you know, people choose not to believe much of what our politicians say. But when David Attenborough <laughs> talks about it, we all believe him. Um, and there was, so there's a shift in the consciousness here over, over that period, which I, think, which I think was real. And the generational divide is, is absolutely critical. There is anger, well-deserved, I think, well-placed in, in many instances, from the younger generation. Our generation has let this slide, and we've got, to, we've got to catch up quick. That's a source for optimism, but we have to listen to it loud. You're not pa painting a very optimistic picture. I mean, has your advice to clients changed at all regarding this? If no one's really asked about sustainability, have, you know, where do you see the conversation going in two years from now, three years from now? Yeah, so our, our role absolutely is to partner our clients on this transition. So the, the, we're, we're not in a stage where we're kind of saying, you know, green is good and brown is bad, and uh, we, we want to partner people on the transition. And there's some nice examples now of us partnering with, with our big clients um, to do some innovative things. We, we've announced with Walmart um, some supply chain financing um, arrangements which will provide Walmart supply chain with cheaper to preferential pricing on their financing if they meet certain certain ESG or transition credentials. 
So it, pilots like that, experiments like that are great. It's, it, you know, our role, to be clear, is to partner our customers on this transition and to help them through it. We're all learning it as we go. Am I optimistic? Um, I mean, events like this help. We've just got to keep the dialogue going on this one. Um, we're bit, I'm optimistic, but we are way behind where we need to be right now. John Flynn, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.